Brrr, it's so cold. Actually, it's cold outside, not in here, thankfully, so I can take this off. There's a wide range of things you can do to try to warm yourself up on a cold day. And in this case, what am I doing? I am building a wood stove. Not like a big wood stove, building a small wood stove. This is for like a tent, a camping type of situation where you need portability. You could scale this up, shrink it down. I don't know how small you could go. So the reason why I want this is I do World War II reenacting, specifically as different partisan representations, so like French resistance. I want a portable stove so I can help heat my food, or give myself a hot cup of coffee on a cold morning, which is really nice. Uh, also, in the future, it'd be awesome if I could figure out some way I could safely use this inside my tent, because uh, uh, being cold in your tent is not quite so nice when you come out from underneath the wool blankets and the sleeping bag. It gets really chilly. I use this actually at a reenactment where it's like 30 degrees at night and in the morning, so it's a little frigid and a little brisk when getting changed. I prefer a little bit more comfor comfort, if possible, that's why I have a wood stove. Uh, or I had a wood stove as I already sold this wood stove. I wasn't planning on selling it. I built it for my own use, but someone there was like, hey, would really like it. So I sold it to them. Now I gotta come up with a 2.0, but that's a story for another day. I have not even figured out what that next stove is gonna look like or what's gonna be like. It's enough, let's get into this stove build. Okay, here's a very, very simplified plan. By the way, love the paint. That's a, that's a new style there. Actually, I'm working on a house project in between this fun project. Time to get on to using the angle grinder. So I started to bend this and the camera was supposed to be rolling, but the SD card got full. So I don't think I got footage of that. But anyways, I've gotten to the point where it started to bend. I had to score it quite far through. Now I'm concerned if I keep bending it, it's gonna break, but we'll see if it's gonna break. I can definitely see some stress marks in the metal. Let's see if you can see it. I don't know if you can see it now, but there's the stress marks. We'll see if it breaks. I'll keep pushing it, seeing if I can get it to bend all the way. Without a metal break, this was really difficult. I did not have a good clamping system or anything like that, but I was eventually able to get the shape I was looking for, uh, but with a lot of extra scoring and bending. Something I will say right here, I've cut out tons of footage just to fit it inside this video. Things did take much longer than what you're seeing here. A little tool hack I like is using an adjustable crescent wrench to add a little extra leverage as you can adjust to the thickness of your metal and makes it easier to bend it. So now not to trust my eyeball, I'm gonna use this little square. Getting very close though. Need to walk this in a tiny bit further. That's pretty good and close. So this side needs to come in a little bit more. At least I got all my dimensions correct, so six and a half, six and a half, and six and a half. So now this box should be ready. Now I just need to cut the top and the back. I mean, the top and the bottom. So I can't find any information really on what's the ideal ratio height versus width for a firebox like this. So I thought the only thing I can fall back onto when deciding is how does the pot or pan fit on it? So, the pan fits great this way. If I rotate it this way and put a top on it, it's not going to get heated as evenly for a pan even this small. So, I'm thinking the squattier version is the version I would go with. It gives me a decent amount to put a lot of fire still in here. I'll just weld my sides here and here, and I'll call it a day. Oh, besides putting the door on it, of course. Can't forget the door. Now I need to cut out all the other random pieces of metal necessary to complete this build. So I thought I'd stop cutting with the angle grinder for a second and share a quick tip. If you find yourself cutting a large chunk of steel like this with your angle grinder and you're cutting a few parts from it, instead of maybe just cutting out one part at a time and decreasing your whole piece's weight, maybe just try scoring deep enough that they're very close to breaking, but they're all holding together. That way you have maximum weight helping hold your work piece in place, especially if you don't have a good way to clamp it in place efficiently. That way your work piece will hold itself mostly in place for you, so your fixturing or your clamping or whatever you're doing does not have to be as precise or perfect. So they will hold everything better in place. So maybe that's a quick tip that will help you with your metal working. So after scoring it all, it's ready to break parts free, which I'm looking forward to. You can see I left little tabs in the corner. 
Let's see if I got that one through far enough. Yep. There's one chunk. And the last piece. Here's one side. Here's the other side. Now the side's in there, and then here's where the door will go. You stoked to see it? It's amazing what you can turn into an instrument, just maybe not everyone wants to hear you. Okay, so this is where I'm at right now. I've cleaned up the edges on the door. I'm gonna make a hinge here so it opens up. Now I need to tack these all together, but I'm taking it outside so I don't have all the fumes inside. So I'm just tacking it enough to hold it together here. Again, as I sort of said earlier, I just need it to hold together so I don't lose my dimensions when I take it outside. I've already gotten a lot of the weld laid down here, again, cutting out tons of footage. These welds were not the prettiest welds in the world, but with a little bit of grinding and then re-welding over the spots that I missed, it turned out quite nice. I have no idea how many grinding wheels I went through and cut off discs on this project. <laughs> Now I have this notch down the door, I actually have to do the same notch out on this side too, just to fit the actual hinge. I use the carbide scriber to mark the location where I need to cut. This step may not have been needed if I had made my own hinge from scratch, but I was trying to use a pre-made one to save a little bit of time. Ugh, the arm workout that makes a terrible noise. Hand filing metal. Ugh, I hate that screech sound. You want to listen to it? So first I tested it, tried it, didn't work, ground it, filed it, ground it, tested it, ground it, filed it, tested it, and eventually it worked. This is how so many projects go, as many of you guys are aware. Again, like earlier in the project, I'm just tacking things in place. I wouldn't necessarily like welding it on the outside like I did here, but I wanted to hold everything together so that I could make sure the alignment of the door was correct so the door would open and close without colliding with the top or the bottom. With the alignment sorted, I could then turn my attention to actually welding the hinge more permanently in place, so I flipped it up on its side. And then I went around spot welding it around the perimeter. Why am I spot welding it? Well, glad you asked. Uh, the hinge metal is rather thin, so the spot welding helped reduce the burn through. I maybe put a little extra weld than necessary, but I didn't want this door falling off. Now that we've made the door, it's time to make the latch that holds the door shut. So I'm just shaping this out of a piece of scrap steel, carving it with my angle grinder with a cutoff disc, and then cleaning it up with a hand file. This is a pretty simple approach. I didn't really have a plan or a pattern. I just kind of winged it. Now I'm going to anchor the latch arm with a threaded screw. While I could have just welded a peg or something in place like that, I went with the screw so I could take things apart. I liked making everything thread together so I could disassemble it for easy transportation or if I wanted to make any changes or upgrades in the future, a threaded piece gave me the options to do so. Though I am welding this part of the latch into place as I don't think I'll probably be needing to change this. So I'm gonna make a little bump out that comes out maybe at a 45 degree angle that this will sit and connect right on. Now I'm not sure how quite this goes set on, but I know the first thing I need to do is I need to cut a hole in the back. Now it'd be nice if I could find a big enough piece of circular pipe that fit in this and this would snap on. Uh, I think I'm just gonna have to probably make some circular semi-shaped item even though I don't have a roller to roll the metal. And this is the point in the project where I really want to measure and then remeasure and then remeasure because I don't want to mess up a project that I put this much time and work into. After all, this next step is cutting a big hole in the back of this box. And making a big metal box turns out not to be so easy with basic tools. So I moved this out of the way so that I can put the box right here and hopefully use my drill press to drill in the corners. So maybe to shed some light on why I'm drilling out these corners, as you can see, I'm putting a hole in each one. The reason being is I'm gonna be using an angle grinder to cut out this square in the back. I've learned if you use an angle grinder due to the arc of the cutoff disc, you have to overcut the corner in order to cut out a box or a shape like that, and that just does not look so nice. So by drilling or cutting the holes with another tool, it reduces the need to overcut the corners to reach the desired shape, which ends up looking better in the long run. And no, I'm not going to reach in with my hands and grab the hot metal. I'm going to use pliers this time. 
There we go. Well, this is not the prettiest hole. Um, it works. I don't need this to be pretty because this is gonna be inside of a stove. I just need it to function. Even though as part of me wants to make this perfect, I just need to clean it up enough that I don't seriously cut myself accidentally when I touch this. So I probably need to hand file a little bit, but not really clean up the corners or make everything perfectly lined up. Next up is possibly the hardest portion of the build, and that is making a rolled piece of metal without any proper tools. And this is the part that's actually going to hold the stovepipe, so it's kind of important. This is reasonably thick metal, so I had to start with a clamp and a pair of channel locks to try to bend it over. I work it down, trying to get it round, but it took a lot of different attempts with various different tools, including hitting it with a hammer. Once I got it somewhat rolled, close to the right size, I took an old wheel from a pallet cart that I happen to have laying around. Yeah, everyone has one of those laying around. I'm now once again using the angle grinder. I'm gonna cut tabs out on the back to create a flat surface that will mate up against the back of the firebox. And then those tabs will form wings that I will drill holes through and drill corresponding holes into the firebox, which I'll tap. That will allow these two assemblies to be screwed together and act as one piece when in use. Okay, so the other camera's battery died, so I'm gonna try to do this handheld. Uh, so I cut this plate of metal out. It hooks onto the bottom of there to create a shelf to kind of close off the bottom at least. And then this is going to mount on the back. There's gonna be holes through here to bolt on. Same thing for over here as well. And the bottom plate will be welded to the circular walls. Here is the piece that I just welded together. And uh, I'll show you how it fits. So coming to the back of the firebox, the lip hooks in like that, tips up, and then there'll be bolts that go through here to bolt this on the back of the firebox. I'm gonna drill these, drill into here, and try to tap in here. Here I'm hooking that lip in that I showed you earlier that I made. In like that, and then if I lined up the holes right, let's see, the screw will go in, and one on the side. So that's super solid on there, and then the stove pipe can fit in. Fits in like that. You can see the front. I didn't connect this together, it acts sort of like a spring. It has a little bit of give to take the stove pipe in and out. It's gonna be a little hard to see. I think you can see it right there. You can see the stove pipe goes up there. Now with most of the build behind me, it's time to move on to making the legs, which I'll be using some scrap angle iron that came from some old bed frames. Now a note on my design idea behind this. I wanted these legs to be able to come off for maximum portability. That way, they take a lot less space when hauling it around versus having the legs permanently attached to the side of the firebox. I'm going to accomplish this by drilling holes through the top angle iron piece and holes that correspond with that on the firebox as well. At this point, all I had to do was to tap these holes that match the thread to the machine screws that I'll be using to hold the legs onto the firebox. I really like this ratcheting handle on this tap set. It really makes things a lot easier. Now watching this footage, I can see how much the firebox moves, so probably would have been better to clamp it down while tapping it. With that all said and done, though, it's time to go ahead and test fit everything together. Okay, let's try setting this up. It's not the flattest thing apparently, but it'll work because it's going to be standing on dirt. So I'm putting the short stovepipe on, just because I don't have no ceiling space here for the long one. There we go. And here's the little stove. There's the inside. It's a little dark. And the stovepipe. Here's the little door. With the latch. Just very basic. The legs. These unbolt, this can get unbolted or unscrewed or however you want to say it. Turning this can be unscrewed and removed as well. I don't know why, but it can be. 
just so this whole thing can sort of pack up as tight as possible uh, to reduce the amount of footprint for traveling and carrying it around. Now that the build is done, let's check out how it worked. Here's it running, it, it heated really nicely if the door was cracked. If we closed the door all the way, the fire would smolder down a lot, it wasn't quite hot enough. If we kept it cracked by about 3 eighths of an inch, boy did it heat up really nicely. Uh, you can see here I was frying some potatoes, oh were those potatoes good. Also made some hot coffee in the morning. There's nothing like hot food and a hot drink in the morning or on a cold day. As I said in the intro of this video, I ended up selling the stove, which was not according to my plan at the end of the reenactment. But anyways, it does present a good opportunity to make a new version. When I start a project, I never know quite where it's gonna end up because I start with the general concept. And then uh, as I go, I just make things up and I see where I end up. So stay tuned because there will be a future video uh, where I'm gonna try to make a 2.0 stove. Anyways, make sure to comment down below. I'd love to hear from you guys. Hit that thumbs up, that'd be greatly appreciated. Subscribe so I can see you in future videos. I'll see you guys later, bye.